Welcome to Spirit of Newt, the podcast that delves into all things Notre Dame football, tracing all the way back to the founder of it all, Knut Rockney. Special guest today is a uh, honored to have this special guest today, a uh, good friend of ours for a long time, uh, whose father, John Pinelli, was a uh, one of the greatest running backs in the history of Notre Dame and um, also was among the um, one of the greatest teams ever, perhaps the greatest college football team ever, the 1946 and 1946, uh, 1946 and 1947 undefeated Notre Dame national championship team under coach Frank Leahy. Andy Pinelli, it's a pleasure to have you, my friend. How you doing? <laughs> Good, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I sure appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be here. <clears throat> Let's talk about your dad for a little bit. Um, back in those days, um, and let me show you a picture real quick. This is the photo of, this is your dad, number 67, and um, his teammates on the bench. And, uh, of course, we're talking about missing teeth. We're talking about blood. We're talking mud. We're talking, you know, some of the toughest people that ever picked up a football. And, um, and one thing that um, back then, those guys went both ways. They, they, they did. Yeah, they sure did. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I got to meet a lot of those guys because uh, – you know, of course, they were good friends. Uh, they were all, all good friends, and they hung out together. Uh, and uh, it was my privilege to get to know quite a few of them. And that, that inspired me to do a, uh, a, a documentary that uh, we called The Greatest Team, uh, Notre Dame's uh, unrivaled 46 and 47 football squad. That's a um, We kind of call it a team because there was very little – change from 46 to 47, Jeff. There's only about three uh, starters that changed position there, but they did play both ways and they were so full of talent. Uh, I, I, I want, That's one of the reasons we, I referred to them as the greatest team and tried to make that argument. They were so deep in talent that uh, they, they would uh, do a platoon style of playing, especially in 46 where the, the first string would play the first and third quarters and the second string would play the second and fourth quarters. And the first team would just beat the hell out of them. And then the second team would go in and, and, and rack up the scoring. And, and amazingly enough, the second team scored more than the first team in, in that uh, first national championship season in 46 when Leahy was back from the war. So they, but they, you have to remember, Jeff, that there was 2 million GIs coming back on the GI Bill from World War II in 45, and they're all enrolling in college for free. So it's like unlimited scholarships for the coaches. They can have a couple hundred guys out there competing to for for you know for for uh, 12 or 24 uh, starting spots on the team so and it was so Notre Dame had a lot of talent but every team had a lot of talent and these were you know battle-hardened soldiers many of them coming coming back so you had guys that were 23 24 years old and some of them already had uh, two years of college ball. Now they're coming back to finish their eligibility. But uh, so, yeah, they were playing both ways, uh, but there, uh, there was so much talent that uh, uh, they could sometimes platoon style it and, uh, uh, and to their advantage if you, had, if you had enough talent out there. But I, I call it, you know, winning back-to-back -back national championship teams in that era, I also – uses an argument because the the competitive field was just so intense with every school having all these GIs back. A very unique era for college football. He played under coach uh, Frank Leahy. Uh, did your dad talk about um, uh, coach Leahy at all? And um, uh, before I get into Rockney, um, if, if you could – Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, as, as you know, uh, 
Leahy played on Rockney's team and was an uh, was an assistant, and um, and then he he, he went uh, uh, to Fordham uh, after he graduated, and and then uh, he he helped. He was the line coach there. He developed the seven blocks of granite they called, one of which was uh, Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi. And then he went to Boston College and took them to 11-0, and 0, and at 31 years old, became the head coach at Notre Dame after that, amazingly enough, 31, and uh, proceeded to, uh, to, to, within two years, get a national championship in 43, went off to war in 44 and 45, and came back in 46. Now, when you talk to the players, they either loved him or hated him. He was brutal. Uh, there's no, there's no question about it. He would, he would scrimmage him four times a week, uh, and and he'd have three scrimmages going on from a from a two-story tower that he built uh, in the in the uh, practice field, and he'd be watching them all. And if he didn't see blood, you were loafing. So I mean, he was uh, he was a tough guy, but. Uh, some of the players like Leon Hart revered him and others uh, really kind of uh, thought he was just a, a little bit kind of sadistic out there. But, uh, but he, he's the, the second winningest percentage coach behind Rockney. So it's kind of like a, a Rockney style coach uh, with all this talent, this world war two talent and uh and a tough guy and, and driving those victories. It four, uh, four undefeated seasons um, with three national championships there from 46 to, to 49, an incredible run. Did your dad ever talk about Rockney and any relationship that um, he might have had with Leahy as far as any techniques or coaching techniques that Leahy may have presented to his players uh, that he learned from Rockney? Yeah, he did. He did mention that, that there, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the technique, especially blocking techniques and uh, uh, that, that lay he had picked up because uh, he was, he was a lineman for, uh, for Rockney. And, uh, uh, and I think he brought some of those, those uh, talents and that attention to detail uh you know, he carried that forward uh, as part of that uh, legacy. You mentioned um, some players hated him, some players loved him. Um, in my book, um, Rockney of Ages, I have a I detail in the back, the disciples section, which uh, outlines 20 biographies of players under Rockney that went, a, went ahead to coach, including Frank Leahy. Yes. Um, those yeah. guys revered Rodney. You didn't have a love hate relationship with, Rock, or they didn't have a love love hate relationship with Rodney. It seemed like everybody that came out of there absolutely revered him. Yeah. It's interesting to say that Leahy had this other kind of you know brutal mentality, so to yeah. speak, yeah. That, that that could have been taken. Either way, I guess. Yeah, I, I, they, were, they, were, they were different personas, and I, I don't think uh, uh, Frank was quite as uh, magnanimous a character as, as Newt was, but he, he did have a, uh, uh, you know, he certainly had uh, uh, folks on the team that revered him. He had a tough challenge, you know, managing college age kids is not like managing. Uh, uh, World War II vets. As a matter of fact, he knew that he had to go off to war himself to be able to manage those guys. When when the vets came back, a lot of coaches were kind of handling the vets with kit gloves because they had served their country. A lot of them had gotten injured uh, in the service of their countries, and, and they respected that, and they handled them gently, not Leahy. Uh, Leahy was one of them. He was, uh, he was, uh, and he was going to be tough on them, as tough on them as he was tough on everybody else. And uh, so that was, that, that's kind of an indicator of his style and maybe a little bit of the difference, you know, of the environment that uh, Rockney and, and Leahy were operating in. 
as they move forward, um, today I know you have Leahy's Lads. You, you, you from from the organization Leahy's Lads, which which brings in players from you know from, from the past uh, of Notre Dame history uh, up into I guess even more recent times. I mean, anybody who played for Notre Dame, I guess, is you know. You're in touch with. Um, what do you, do you see a breaking point? Because what, one thing I've noticed is that the the younger players or the more recent players of the past ten to twenty years really know nothing about Rodney, New Rodney, or even you know Frank Leahy, maybe, uh, but particularly Canoe Rodney. Um, do you see a like a breaking point in, in, in time from the players that you've dealt with that, that knew about Canute Rockney and then maybe some of the more recent ones that really are kind of maybe time has passed, passed him by, so to speak. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I, I think there's a, uh, I'm finding that there's a shallow knowledge of the history. Um, you know, Jeff, Without Rockney and Leahy, uh, you know there was there was a, a, a quote by uh, by Bob Nagel, uh, uh, our, our former sportscaster for WSBT there in South Bend, that, that really struck me, and he said, you know, without Rockney and Leahy, Notre Dame might have evolved to be like Marquette. Um, you know, and that's not to slam Marquette. I've got a daughter going to Marquette. Uh, it's a great school, but it's it's not Notre Dame. And football helped make Notre Dame great and, and helped put Notre Dame on the map and give it a national reputation. And uh, I, th I think that uh, uh, that's lost on a lot of people, the importance of, of football and helping to make Notre Dame what it is. Now, certainly Notre Dame is a lot more than football now, and it was then, but, uh, but football really was important to the history and development of it. And, and I think that uh, the greatness of those teams can't be, um, you know, can't be underscored or, or spotlighted enough because they really were um, heads and shoulders above everybody else that was playing in the field. It wasn't just that they won national championships. They were heads and shoulders above them uh, in, in, in terms of uh, their performance and, and the caliber of the players. And um, so it's, it's, uh, it's not that those are the things that people don't realize that, that uh, in the eras that they were playing in, you know, these uh, how, how, uh, how well Notre Dame did and how competitive it was. So I think that's why it's important that you're doing the work that you are to put the spotlight on Rockney. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the greatest team documentary uh, that, uh, that I put out, these are, these are trying to keep this piece of, of history alive um, so that uh, people don't forget that heritage in, in how that heritage has helped make uh, Notre Dame the, the place that it is today. I tell people, especially after, you know, in conjunction with my book, I tell people, Knut Rockney actually shaped the football. <laughs> he shaped the football that he sold. He turned it from a, like a medicine ball type rugby ball and streamlined it with an air valve where you could monitor the air pressure to make it more comfortable for the quarterback to pass, which he was also the first one to implement the pass. Right, right. right. Yeah. And moving forward, and you just mentioned with Notre Dame, he is also the first football, football coach, pro or college or otherwise, to take a team national, to go from the East Coast, from New York, to the West Coast. And, I mean, the NFL, even during the 20s, they were the Midwest. You know, it was Green Bay, Chicago, Canton, Detroit, you know, and um, and and I try to – that's why – that's why I, and I agree with you. 
uh, that uh, and the work you're doing, you know, with with the, you know, through, through your father and and through through the through the DVD that you have with the greatest team, um, it's really important for I believe the young folks today at Notre Dame, especially the young players, and even the coaches today. I think they should take a page, take a step back, and go back ninety years, a hundred years and revisit some of this just to go back to the foundation of football, which was founded right there at Notre Dame. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, that's a great point because Newt Rockney was such an innovator from, from a marketing standpoint, um, not only as a coach, but, but the way that he, he, he marketed Notre Dame uh, and, and brought national attention to the, the uh, institution. And Leahy was also an innovator, um, like Rockney. He, you know, he, he watched uh, something that really caught his attention with the Chicago Bears on the T formation. He was the first college uh, coach to bring the T formation to college football. And then you, you, you put that in with, uh, uh, you know, with the team that he had uh, and, and, uh, guys uh, like Lou Jack and, and, and Ratterman and Trapuca, um, who were fantastic quarterbacks. And by the way, you know, probably Notre Dame never had was so deep in quarterbacks as they were in 46 and 47, um, with each guy being so close in talent. But, uh, but Lou Jack being a, as Heisman Trophy winner was just such a great runner and scrambler as well as being a pinpoint uh, having pinpoint accuracy as a passer to, uh, to, to make that T formation work the way that it did. And then, you know, when you've got great halfbacks like he had with Mello and Pinelli and Sitko and, uh, and Terry Brennan, who later became a coach uh, after uh, Leahy, you know, they had a, you know, great backfield, you know, they had 11, they had 11 all Americans on the team. Uh, they wound up with, you know, two Outland trophy winners, two, uh, uh, two Heisman trophy winners. And uh, they, they were just so rich in talent that uh, they were, they were really unstoppable. Andy, I really, really appreciate your time today. Uh, take your time with us. Uh, we're going to do this again. And uh, I, I want you to come back because we got a lot more to talk about. There. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in the, the, the greatest team uh, uh, video documentary, which is available at the Notre Dame bookstore on uh, Amazon, uh, you know, th we've got, uh, we got an, uh, pr probably 70 minutes of just wild stories that, uh, that we're talking about with, uh, you know, this was a, a documentary where we had the players talking about what it was like to uh, play and uh, for Leahy, and they had so many great stories. And the documentary uh, also includes sports writers from that era talking about it. And we have some actual very rare live footage. Uh, th uh, there's very little footage of Leahy actually speaking, and we found footage of uh, Leahy that we included in that documentary. So anybody that's interested on the area, check out greatestteam.com uh, or uh, check out the Facebook page, um, uh, Greatest Team ND. And Jeff, thank you for uh, having me on today. And uh, keep uh, bringing that uh, Notre Dame history to the forefront and keeping it alive. Thank you for all you're doing. An absolute pleasure, my friend. This is Jeff Harrell. We are at Augie's Locker Room in South Bend, and uh, we're signing off for now. But uh, we'll be back with more next time. Take care. Hey, Irish fans. Augie here. Uh, just a uh, kind of a teaser for today. These two items are going to be up on the website in the next day or two. Two of the greatest pieces we've got up there, besides the fact we have the board, the coach's blackboard up there, you got to go in and see that. That's an amazing piece. This is a piece that I think most fans would under, understand and enjoy. This was a game ball from 1988. We don't know specifically the game, but the year of the national championship, Lou Holtz versus Miami. Lou, before the game, 
players kind of sh uh, scuffle uh, in in the uh, tunnel. Lou has the players scared because he says, tells them to get their asses in the locker room. Once they get inside, they're expecting him to chew them out, cuss at him. But what he says is, save Jimmy Johnson's ass for me. Lou signed this game ball, save Jimmy Johnson's ass for me. It's Beckett authenticated. We have pictures of Lou signing it. This is going on the website. One of a kind piece, $3,500 game ball, 1988. One of a kind. Great piece. 2017, we're at a Comic Con. My sons and I are down in Indianapolis. Sean Aston appears. Sean Aston sees our stool, grabs us, brings us up to the cameras. We're standing on stools, gold stools, just like you see here that are in the locker room. We get a picture. It's hard to see, but Sean is standing on a stool that we actually have in the store right now. I've marked it. It is the stool he stood on, but not necessarily in the movie. But this is one of the actual stools from the movie, from the locker room. This is going on our website in the next 24 hours. $2,000. You can't find a stool like this, a gold stool anywhere. So you'll get authenticity with this. So go to augieslockerroom.com. Look at our new website. It's amazing what George is doing. We just are so proud of the work he's doing and all, all of us here at Augie's Locker Room. So I just want to tell everybody, go Irish! <laughs>